on tobacco recovery will be presented by Anna Biber and a panel of former smokers that Anna will introduce later in the program. Anna has worked with Don Farm since 2005, initially as a detox counselor, later as an outpatient counselor, and then pro project manager, before assuming her current position as program coordinator for the Don Farm Sparrow Recovery Center, um, which is a non-medical detoxification and extended care facility. As a founding member of Don Farm's tobacco cessation team, Anna helped to develop, implement, and facilitate Don Farm's tobacco cessation initiative. Please join me in welcoming Anna and her panel. Welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. So I'd like to start this presentation by saying that I get that this is a hard sell. Tobacco recovery is hard for people to talk about uh, in the context of addiction treatment and recovery. And so part of what we're going to try to convey today is just why this is something important for us to kind of have on the radar. And when we're talking about tobacco recovery, we're talking about more than just smoking cigarettes. So I might default to saying smoking cigarettes at some point, but really I'm talking about use of any tobacco product. So it could be any that you see listed or any tobacco or nicotine product that, you, that comes to mind when you think about using these substances. What we're going to talk about um, today is why we should talk about tobacco, some myths and truths about addressing tobacco use in addiction recovery, strategies for quitting, tips for helping professionals, and then we'll have a panel with some quit stories. I'm also super informal when I present, so if you have any questions as we go along, please raise your hand and ask. I'll probably be asking you some questions as we go along. Um, so feel free to raise your hand if something pops into your mind. Whoa. So when we're talking about tobacco, what we're really talking about is nicotine addiction. Nicotine is the, is the substance in tobacco products that makes, them, uh, makes us dependent on them. And nicotine dependence is the most common form of chemical dependence in the United States. So this is a big deal because there's research that demonstrates that nicotine has a, is as addictive as any of these other substances that we tend to think about as more addictive and maybe has a higher capture rate than these. And so when we're talking about capture rate, what we're talking about is what percentage of people who try this substance become physically dependent or become dependent on it, have an addiction to it. And a lot of people try alcohol, for example, 92% of the general population, and about 13% of the population develops a substance use disorder or a dependence on alcohol. But three quarters of people who, who try tobacco products ever, about 24% of, of people develop a dependence on them. So it has a higher capture rate than alcohol. And you can see that a lot of these substances, much, a much smaller percentage of the overall population tries them in the first place, but they have relatively small capture rates too. So there's also this conception just in terms of like other, that we think about as more addictive substances. The majority of people who use those, even the majority of people who use cocaine don't develop a dependence on it. It's a relatively small percentage for anybody who tries a substance. Um, when we're talking about a tobacco use disorder, we're talking about a series, or a, not necessarily a series, a cluster of um, symptoms that would indicate that there's a substance use disorder. So the same is true for tobacco use disorders. This is from the DSM-5, so Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the fifth edition. And basically, this is how we diagnose if some, or one of the strategies we can use to diagnose if someone has a substance use disorder, in this case, a tobacco use disorder. So I want you to think about if you're someone who uses tobacco or has used tobacco before, how many of these you relate to in terms of your own use of tobacco. So the first one is, and we're looking at um, within the last 20, I'm, I'm sorry, within the last 12 month period, so within the last year, um, or in the last year of your, of your use if you're someone who hasn't used in over a year. So tobacco was often taken in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than was intended. So I said, this is my last pack of cigarettes and then I'm not gonna smoke again. Or I said, I'm just gonna smoke half a pack today. And then I ended up smoking more than I intended. Second one, there's a persistent desire or unsuccessful attempts to cut down or control my use. So I wanna quit, I keep trying to quit, but I can't quite get there. I keep trying and it's not happening. Three, a great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain or use tobacco. So this one's a little trickier for tobacco, but I think about things like 
spending a bunch of time searching through the couch cushions to see if I can find enough money to get a pack of cigarettes, stuff like that, right? Where it's a disproportional amount of time for what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, craving or a strong desire or urge to use tobacco. Recurrent tobacco use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or at home. So I really wanted to get through my daughter's recital, but I couldn't get through it without having to leave to smoke a cigarette. Or I'm taking a lot of smoke breaks at work and it's, it's impacting my job performance. Um, continued tobacco use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems that are exacerbated or caused by the effects of tobacco. So this is things like getting into arguments with my significant other about my smoking or in some way having social consequences. My friends all want to go out to this bar. There's maybe not a bar. My friends all want to go out to this event. There's no smoking at this event and I can't quite make it through that because I need to step out and, and be able to smoke cigarettes. Important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of tobacco use. So it's getting in the way. I really like to play basketball, and I was on this league. It's getting in the way of that. It's getting in the way of me doing the things that I want to be able to do. I'm having a hard time even walking up the stairs, much less running across the field. Uh, recurrent tobacco use in situations in which it's physically hazardous. So this is things like smoking in bed or being distracted when I'm driving because I'm trying to I can drop my lighter on the ground, I gotta rustle around and figure out where it is, things like that. Uh, tobacco use is continued despite knowledge of having persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problems that have been caused or exacerbated by tobacco. So I've got this cough that won't go away. I think it might be related to my tobacco use, but I'm not really sure. I know I've got COPD or some higher blood pressure, something that's exacerbated and, it's, and I'm still smoking or I'm still using tobacco despite that. And then tolerance and withdrawal. So tolerance, I need more in order to get the desired effect. And withdrawal, I have symptoms of withdrawal when I stop using. So <clears throat> the DSM-5 tells us that within the same 12-month period, two or three of these symptoms would indicate a mild tobacco use disorder, four or five would indicate moderate, and six or more symptoms would indicate a severe tobacco use disorder. So again, what's the big deal about this? Why does it apply, like what, why do we care, right? In the United States, tobacco is the leading cause of preventable disease, disability, and death. The leading cause. One in every five United States deaths is attributable to smoking. And for every person who actually dies for that one in five deaths, there are 30 more who are suffering from at least one tobacco-related illness. So I have COPD, I have asthma, I have heart disease, I have emphysema, I have something related. And people know this. I mean, I've never met someone who was like, I had no idea smoking wasn't great for me, right? So like we get that these things are possible. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time like harping on this isn't great for you. One thing that gets people's attention sometimes is impotence. Like maybe that's a little bit motivating, but in general, it's not good. <laughs> But a lot of times we're thinking like, these are things that are gonna happen way in the future. I don't need to worry about this today, although maybe the impotence. I don't need to worry about this today, but I need to, but, and by the time it like comes up in 10 years or 20 years or whatever, I'll have figured it out by then, right? But what ends up happening is like, I never get to the point where I figure it out, and then these things, like the day comes when like, these are problems that I'm experiencing now. Um, there's also a lot of chemicals that have been found in cigarettes. So there's tobacco we know, there's nicotine we know, but there's a lot of additives that, that can make um, tobacco products more addictive or can be used in the process of um, manufacturing them. Lots of things that I don't want in my body. Carbon monoxide, cyanide, formaldehyde, lead, mercury, nickel. These are not great things. And they're found in very trace amounts, really small amounts, but the more that I smoke and the longer that I smoke, the more of these trace amounts I get in my body and the more that they can build up, right? So eventually they become a problem. If I smoke one cigarette, this is probably not the biggest deal in the world. If I smoke two packs a day for 20 years, this starts to become significant, the buildup of these things. So comorbidity, what does this have to do with addiction to alcohol and other drugs too? So for youth, 
uh, kids aged 12 to 17, 59 point, I'm sorry, 52.9% of youth who had used tobacco in the past month had also used other drugs. Compared to only 6% of youth who hadn't used tobacco had used other drugs. So if I'm looking at a kid who's smoking cigarettes, more than 50% of them have also used other substances in the past 30 days. That's a significant difference, especially compared to this smaller number. And then if I broaden that and I take those kids plus the adult population, so people aged 12 and up, 22.6 of them had used tobacco in the past month. Who had used tobacco in the past month reported current use of other drugs also, compared with less than 5% of the population who didn't use tobacco. So there's a big correlation between people who are using tobacco products and people who are using other alcohol and drugs. So the good news is that in the high school population, there's a decreased use in cigarettes. The bad news is that there's an increased use in e-cigarettes and that uh, there's a, a significant likelihood that when people st start to use e-cigarettes, they'll eventually start smoking other cigarettes or using other substances. Um, and the jury's still kind of, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but the jury's still kind of out on the e-cigarettes too. For a long time, they weren't regulated by the FDA. In 2016, they started to be regulated, which meant that you couldn't get them as freebies. You had to be at least 18 in order to purchase um, electronic nicotine delivery systems, they call them ENDS. You had to be at least 18 to purchase them. Um, you, they need, whoever was manufacturing them needed to show, I, show I, uh, ask for ID. They needed to be manufactured in a way that was like compliant with regulations, but that stuff's kind of slow to um, permeate the broader culture, I would say. Um, 2018, there needs to be uh, warning labels on electronic nicotine device uh, packaging that says that they are not safe for you. And there's just, there's push though to try to reduce the amount the FDA released this big thing about um, tobacco products this summer. And there's a push to try to reduce the nicotine that's in tobacco products to make them less addictive. And there's also a push to try to develop new nicotine uh, delivery systems that can be less harmful, that are more regulated and less harmful than, than regular cigarette smoking. So there's a lot of, and I'm sure like in the next few years, this is gonna end up, uh, all the e-cigarette stuff is gonna become even more broadly utilized, so it'll be interesting to kind of see how that shakes up and shakes out in terms of regulation as well. Okay, so who's still smoking cigarettes in the United States? Uh, there's, over the last several decades, there is a lot of information campaigns about the dangers of smoking cigarettes and tobacco use, and so the percentage of people in the United States that, that are smokers has been decreasing. And we're at about 17.8% of the general population in the United States smoke, smoke cigarettes right now, which is good. It's way down from where it was several decades ago. But there are still certain subpopulations that smoke at higher rates than other people. So one of, uh, one of the factors is education. So people with a lower level of formal education, so people with a GED, smoke at the rate of 41.4% versus only 5.6% of people with a graduate degree. So education's a factor. Poverty is also a factor. 29.2% uh, of people living below the poverty line use tobacco versus 16% of people who live above the poverty line. Um, so overall percentages are decreasing consistently, but for certain populations, they're not decreasing. And for one population that we care a lot about, the numbers of people who are still using tobacco are super high. What population is that? Yeah, people who are in, people who have addiction, who are in or out of recovery. And what do you think the rates for people who have addiction? Oh, it's even higher. It's usually like 75 to 80% of people who have addiction, you also use tobacco. Mental illness is also a super high, same range approximately. So we have a certain population that we hear a lot about that also is using at super disproportionately high rates. And so that brings us to our first myth. And there are, there's a handout, a little flyer, out on the counter outside that is, it's white and it has an ashtray on it. And it has all of the myths that I'm, I'm about to go through on it um, that was published a few years ago. So it doesn't have all of the most updated studies, but basically we're just going to go through that. 
So the first myth is that smoking is less of a problem today. And again, for the general population, smoking is less of a problem today than it was in the past, but for people who have addiction, it is not less of a problem. So uh, pretty consistently over the past several years, it's 75 to 80% of people who have addiction also use tobacco, and most people who come to the farm are using tobacco or nicotine, usually tobacco. You, I think, I mean, we track this every year. We've been tracking it for several years. It's usually about 80% of our emissions are using tobacco. So again, tobacco use is decreasing in the general population, but it's still a huge problem among people who have addiction, both in recovery and in active addiction. Myth number two, smoking isn't going to kill me. So um, there's a lot of studies on this too, and 80% um, of all drug-related deaths are due to tobacco, so more than heroin, more than alcohol, more than any other substance. And even for people who are in recovery, the leading cause of death is tobacco-related illness. So you're more likely to die from tobacco-related illness than you are from any other cause, including relapse and overdose. So there was a study that was done at the Mayo Clinic, and I really like this study because it's a longitudinal study and there was quite a high, um, there was quite a large number of people that participated in the study. So it was people who were admitted to inpatient addiction treatment to the Mayo Clinic between 1972 and 1983. And then they followed up with these people in the mid 90s. So it was either 10 or 20 years after they had been in treatment. At the time that they came into treatment, 80% of people used tobacco of some sort, 75% were smokers, five used other types of tobacco. And at follow-up in 1994, uh, 222 of these people, of the 850 original people, had died. 34% of them were attributable to alcohol. That's a significant percentage. 8% were attributable to both alcohol and tobacco, but more than 50% of the deaths were attributable to tobacco, not alcohol. Right, so this is for people who were in addiction treatment and more than half of the deaths were specifically tobacco related, not related to the substance that they came into treatment for. So what the conclusion here is that tobacco was the leading cause of death for people who had been, in tre who'd been treated for alcoholism. And again, this is a big number. This is 845 people in this sample size. It's possible that they were just old. Although these were, these were specifically, like the cause of death was specifically attributable to, el to tobacco use though. So it was things related to tobacco, emphysema, lung cancer, those sorts, of things, those sorts of things, heart disease, COPD, stuff like that. Um, do you recognize this guy? Yep. Yep. So this is Bill W. He's one of the founders of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he died from alcohol-related illness. I'm sorry, he died from tobacco-related illness, not alcohol. Yes, tobacco-related illness. So myth number three, they're really separate issues. So there's, again, a lot of research been done on this. Smoking increases the urge to use. The severity of my tobacco use predicts poor treatment outcomes. So the more that I smoke, the heavier that I smoke, the more likely I am to actually be unsuccessful in treatment. There were significantly better recovery rates for people who, just, who uh, were non-tobacco users. Tobacco can harm recovery and trigger other substance use, especially for people whose primary drug use is alcohol. There's a serious pairing between alcohol and tobacco in our brains. And so when I, so every time that I smoke a cigarette, I'm lighting up that part of my brain that also want, ha, like indicates a craving for alcohol, right? And so I'm more likely, and a, and a lot of people will describe this in their active addiction, like smoking went hand in hand with their using. And I think some, pe some of the people on our panel will talk about that today. These things, were, these things are really paired. And when I am triggering the addiction part of my brain, it doesn't know that I'm triggering it with tobacco instead of heroin or tobacco instead of alcohol. I'm still, I'm still hitting that button. And continued use of tobacco use, tobacco products impairs recovery. So basically people who smoke are less likely to be successful in recovery. That doesn't mean it's not possible. Like I don't want to put out there that like this isn't a thing for you, but it makes it more complicated. Okay, this comes from the University of California. After one month of sobriety, recovering alcoholics who smoked showed significantly less improvement than those who did not smoke in both brain function and neurochemical markers of brain cell health. So in recovery, our brains have a lot of healing to do. And the more that we can kind of get out of the way and let that healing happen, the, the better. And continued smoking among smokers and smoking initiation among non-smokers 
were associated with greater odds of substance use disorder relapse. And this is just from 2017. So myth number four, one thing at a time. So we hear this all the time, right? I need to just address one thing. This is too much. I've already got a lot on my plate. I need to not worry about this for right now. So clients who quit smoking were significantly more likely to be abstinent at follow-up. So in this study, 93% of people who had quit smoking were still abstinent versus 62% of people who had not quit smoking. So this is a pretty significant discrepancy, but both of those numbers are pretty good. So I'm gonna say this treatment center is doing a good job. Um, this treatment center, maybe not so great, 48%, but still okay, 48% of non-tobacco users were still sober compared to 14% of tobacco users. So again, like we have a significant, nearly 30 percentage points difference in outcomes between people who smoke and people who don't smoke. Um, so it makes a big difference. And we tend to think this is gonna be too much, but we wouldn't compartment, or we don't compartmentalize other things in the same way. If someone comes into treatment for opiate addiction, we don't say, okay, we're gonna uh, work on uh, not shooting heroin, but you can still drink, right? Or we wouldn't say, we're gonna, I'm, I really wanna stop smoking crack, but I'm still gonna drink alcohol, right? So we roll all of those things into one thing, but we tend to wanna to put tobacco use, even though it's still a substance and it's still something we're addicted to, in a different compartment. Um, okay, so again, still on one thing at a time, the treatment of tobacco dependence actually enhanced abstinence from drinking. And among adults with alcohol use disorders, use of cigarettes was associated with significant increased likelihood of alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence three years later. So if I address my tobacco use now, it can actually improve my overall chances of recovery. Again, that doesn't mean it's absolutely necessary, but if there is anything that I can do to, in to improve my odds of being successful with this, I wanna try to address it. And as a helping professional, if there's something that we can be doing to try to help our clients be more successful, we definitely want to be moving in that direction. So again, quitting smoking does not jeopardize sobriety or treatment outcomes, and there's been loads of studies on this over several decades. Myth number five, I'll quit later on my own. I hear this one a lot. I don't want to do it right now. I do want to do it. I'll do it when I get out of treatment. And it always kind of cracks me up because when you're in treatment, you have loads of support, lots of people to talk to, loads of resources, like it's the best time to try to work on a behavior change that's really challenging. The idea that I'm gonna be more motivated or have more support or have more resources when I leave here just seems sort of counterintuitive. Um, but I do hear this a lot and I get it. Like it's hard to make a decision to work on all of this stuff. Um, but only in, the, in one study, only 7% of alcoholic smokers were successful in quitting compared to 49 of non-alcoholic smokers. So what this gets into is that if, I'm a, if I smoke, but I'm not an addict, I'm more likely to be successful when I quit smoking, right? And I'm more likely to be successful when I quit smoking, especially without help. But if, I have, if I'm a smoker and I have addiction, only 7% of people were successful in this study. Nicotine dependence is more severe in those with a history of alcohol dependence. So people who uh, have addiction tend to smoke more heavily. They tend to inhale more deeply. They tend to, they tend to use tobacco in a more problematic way than people who don't have other addictions also. And in this study, 0 to 12% of clients quit on their own. So 0% is really bad, you guys. Like We can do better than this. And we want to, we want to provide su support and help people to work on this so that they can be successful. So the bottom line here is that people with addiction have a harder time quitting than people who don't have addiction, and so they need more support, just like we need support for the other things that we're working on. Um, this is packaging from Canada. They do a half and half, so you get half of like whatever your marketer came up with and then half of something terrible that shows that this isn't good for you. Um, and what I, why I like this one is studies have shown that tobacco can be harder to quit than heroin or cocaine. So again, we tend to think about this as like something different, something I don't need help with in the same way, something I can do on my own, even though I would never say, or some, I mean, we might try, but a lot of us, if we're in recovery, will say like, I need other people in order to help me with this. I can't just quit on my own. I need the social support of 12-step recovery or whatever, treatment, whatever. And, but we tend to want this tobacco use to be different. I should just be able to quit when I want to quit. Myth number six, I'm only hurting myself. So what we're getting at with this one is that when I'm smoking, 
in a treatment center and the and or it, at 12 cent meetings or I'm smoking whatever if I if I'm encouraging through my action other people who maybe not are who aren't smokers to start smoking that actually decreases their likelihood of success so the people who have the worst recovery outcomes statistically again doesn't mean it's not possible but statistically the worst uh, outcomes are for people who start smoking in treatment. So I come into treatment as a non-smoker and I start smoking there. So we want to try to create a culture where that doesn't have to happen. And it's hard because a lot of times the culture in a treatment center or the culture in recovery <coughs> is a culture that's a smoking culture. And so how can we support people who are non-smokers in that culture? Um, there are actually a couple of states on the East Coast that have banned, like as an entire state, you can't smoke in any treatment center in the state. Michigan's not really, Michigan's not there, they're not really close to being there, but there are a lot of treatment centers in this area that have just made a decision to go to have a smoke-free campus. So myth number seven, and this ties into that, like I'll be more likely to leave. So, ha so with these different states and with these different programs that have gone tobacco-free, has that mean that fewer people come into treatment or has that mean that meant that more people leave treatment or treatment is less successful and that hasn't shown to be true? So smoke-free policy has had no adverse effects on treatment outcomes, clients complained, not everybody loves this, but they didn't leave at higher rates and there was no increase in irregular discharges. So there was no increase in people being asked to leave because they didn't comply with the non-smoking requirement. So quitting smoking has not been associated with people getting discharged or leaving treatment early. Myth number eight is that people don't want to quit. So most people think that treatment centers should help people quit smoking and most people have a desire to quit smoking. What happens a lot is, so we ask every single person who comes into any service at Don Farm, we ask them if they're interested in quitting smoking. And almost always there's like a knee jerk, nope. And what it is, if we explore a little bit, people say, well, I wanna quit, like I don't wanna keep doing this, but I don't wanna quit right now. So what they're afraid of is like, we're gonna put pressure on you to like do it this minute. And we don't wanna do that either, right? But we want to start to explore like, what would this look like for me? What support would I need? How can I be moving towards this? And more honestly of a harm reduction approach. So, okay, I was smoking a pack a day. What would it take for me to smoke 15 cigarettes a day instead? What would it take for me to smoke 10 cigarettes? What would it take for me to be moving in the direction of being a non-smoker? It's been proven to be effective for people to just discontinue like cold turkey. It's also been proven to be effective for people to reduce because if you reduce, it's been shown to be more likely that you'll eventually move towards abstinence. So I think both of them have an abstinence goal in terms of effectiveness, but it's just sort of the path that you take to get there. Honestly, I think that's more of an individual personality thing. So like when we talk about, if we're talking about someone who has addiction, a lot of us relate to the idea of like, I, of like, I can't control my use. So I can't just decide like, I'm only gonna use opiates on the weekend. I'm only gonna drink after five. You know, a lot of us have tried stuff like that and it hasn't been successful. So when I try to say like, I'm only gonna smoke two cigarettes today, like we're not successful with that. But then there are some people who are successful with that, right? It just, it's sort of a problem severity and what approach works best for each individual. So I, again, I think where the benefit comes from is if you're moving basically, if you're moving in a direction of getting down to zero. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So none of this is like a guarantee. It's not a guarantee that if you quit smoking today, you're gonna stay sober forever and you're never gonna get sick. There's gonna be a slide in a minute. So basically, and there's a, actually there's a bunch of slides in your handout, which I took out, which I'm not gonna go over, but basically say like, here are some immediate positive effects that you can have in your body if you quit smoking, and then these different positive effects that like uh, that continue the longer that you stay abstinent. But it's not a guarantee. I mean, it's not a get out of jail free. It's not a guarantee that if you quit smoking today, that you're that you're going to stay well or that you're going to be well. But it's again increasing the likelihood. So what are the things that I can do to make it more likely that I'm going to be healthy, and what are the things that I can do that make it more likely that I'm going to be sick? And I, we can definitely say that if you're using tobacco, you're more likely to be sick. And if you are not using tobacco, you're more likely to be healthy. Yeah, I mean, it's all on the same neural pathway. So nicotine is, is moving in this, the same pathway that alcohol or opiates or other things that I might be addicted to. Are, are, is, it's all on the same thing. And I can give you more information about that. Okay, so again, people don't want to quit. Most people do. Most have a desire to do it, but they feel freaked out about the idea of whether they don't know how to get started. 
46% were very or moderately interested, and less than 10% of people have no past quit attempts. So most people have tried to quit before, and some, maybe they're not, maybe they're on the fence about it, maybe there's some ambivalence, maybe they don't feel like it's possible, but most people have thought about it and have made attempts in the past. Myth number nine, I won't be able to quit. So if people, just like in recovery, if we have adequate support of adequate intensity and duration, we can do this. So post-discharge, 58% in this study were nicotine-free. Most can quit, but staying quit is difficult. We can relate to that with a lot of our other um, addiction stuff. And reduced tobacco use is associated with improved treatment outcomes and increased motivation to quit. So even if we're reducing, we're still moving in the right direction. How many quit attempts do you think most people have on average before they're able to stay abstinent? Tobacco. It's seven. And I, and I like to say that because I like people to know, like, just because you quit once or twice or three times or four times or five times and weren't able to be successful doesn't mean you're not going to be successful. So don't quit quitting. Don't quit quitting. On the other hand, part of me doesn't like saying that because I don't want people to be, like, on their first attempt and be like, I've got six more in me, right? <laughs> so if now is the time for you, now is the time for you. Just go with it. Go with that momentum. Um, okay, so what's hard about this? There are three broad categories of things that make this really challenging. The habit of it, just the routine, the familiarity, the lighting up a cigarette after I, after I eat a meal, getting in the car, lighting up a cigarette at certain, at certain points. The coping skill of it, so how do I deal with life on life's terms? How do I deal with emotions? So I, I used to facilitate, when I worked at the farm, at the farm farm, I facilitated the tobacco recovery group once a week. And there was a gentleman that was in the group, and he had, uh, he had been in treatment for a couple months. He'd been coming to the group regularly. He hadn't smoked in a while, I think like a week or something, uh, which in treatment is a while. <laughs> uh, he hadn't smoked in about a week, and he uh, requested to phase up to third phase. So there's three phases in, in treatment at the farm. He requested to phase up to third phase, and he didn't phase up. And he was really disappointed and bummed. He thought he was doing an awesome job, and he was just kind of bummed about it, sad. So what did he do? He smoked a cigarette, right? And then he was like, oh man, I gotta get back on the wagon. And then he like didn't smoke again for several days in a row. And the next time he had an opportunity, he requested to phase up and he got third phase. And he was super excited, really grateful. I mean, what happened? He smoked a cigarette. And what I like about that example is that this is like, how, how do I deal with boredom? How do I deal with sadness? How do I deal with disappointment? How do I deal with happiness? How do I deal with anything? I smoke a cigarette. Group was really boring, smoke a cigarette. I just had a really hard conversation with my sponsor, smoke a cigarette. Like it's how I deal with my emotions, good or bad or indifferent, right? And so if we, it forces, if we take that away, that coping skill, it forces us to build coping skills in a different direction. It forces us to figure out how we deal with that in a different way other than putting a substance in our body, which is tricky. And then the physical dependence. And this, honestly, for most people, is the least hard part. The physical, actual physical dependence on nicotine and the withdrawal <laughs> symptoms associated with that. Yeah, it's, it's real, part of what's really hard about this, and we'll get into this in a minute, is that a lot, for a lot of us, a big part of our recovery is the recovering community. And the recovering community has been very like, open to tobacco use for a long time, like forever, really. And that's not, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way at all. So part of what we're trying to do, a big part of what we're trying to do in treatment at Dawn Farm is get people integrated into the recovering community. That's like the most important thing. And we want people to do what people in the recovering community do, right? And what people in the recovering community do in a lot of cases is use tobacco. And so it's, it really creates this like dissonance because we know that you're more likely to stay, we know that this is all part of the same thing and that you're more likely to stay abstinent from everything if you quit smoking. And we also know that integrating into the recovering community is a huge part of recovery for most people. And so without that, a lot of us are lost. So like, how do we marry those two things together? And it, that's part of what makes it hard and, and part, really the biggest thing that makes it us not just decide we're a tobacco-free campus, right? It's, it makes it really complicated. So, and have it, have, makes us have to take more nuanced steps in moving forward. Um, so cost of quitting too. Social impact in the recovering community, again, maybe the most important thing. How does this impact my relationship? So after the meeting when everyone's outside smoking a cigarette, like how do I develop relationships with people? And there's definitely strategies for this and definitely people in the recovering community who are not tobacco users. 
And so it's a matter of like seeking those people out and finding things, like maybe I like do a service commitment, clean up coffee or fold chairs or something after the meeting instead of going outside, stuff like that. It's hard work, so I really have to figure out alternative coping skills, find people who don't use tobacco, be mindful of the situations that are hard for me and that are triggering. Letting go of that culture of addiction. So a lot of times when I was doing that group at the farm, people would say like, this is the last bad thing I get to do, right? This is the last like bit of culture of addiction that I get to hold on to. And so like that bit of identity is really powerful for people a lot of times. So how do I let go of that? Like this is my safe addiction that I get to continue. And then nicotine withdrawal. So again, the DSM-5. Um, so we're looking for nicotine withdrawal if, we've been, if I've been using daily for several weeks, so I have a physical dependence on the nicotine, and I abruptly discontinue or reduce significantly the amount that I'm using. Within 24 hours, I might experience some of these symptoms. Irritability, frustration, anger, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, increased appetite, restlessness, depressed mood, or insomnia. So, and this can last, I mean, it doesn't usually last a super long time. It just depends on, from person to person. It might be a couple of days. It might be a little bit longer. Um, but for most people, this is not, this is a much less significant withdrawal than what they've experienced in other uh, withdrawal situations. And a lot of times if I just recognize like these, this is kind of how I'm gonna be feeling when I stop smoking, I can deal with that. Like I can think of ways ahead of time that I'm gonna cope with these feelings. What am I gonna do when I'm having a hard time sleeping? What am I gonna do when I feel super irritable? What am I gonna do when um, I just feel restless and I, like, I don't know what to do with myself? So making a plan, so knowing this ahead of time and making a plan for this can, can be helpful in terms of coping. Another thing that can be helpful and is recommended is to make a list of the reasons that I want to quit. So it might be things that are on this list. Um, the most effective way to make a list of reasons to quit is if you make your own list of reasons. So everybody just think in your head for a second, what are a couple of reasons that you might want to quit smoking? Or if you have quit smoking or a non-smoker, what are a couple of your top reasons that you don't smoke? Or what are a couple of reasons that this is important to you? Because if I personalize it and make it about me and what's best for me, that's way better than if it's uh, sort of a general. And then life expectancy. So the life expectancy for somebody who, um, who smoked until they died, 69 for men, 73 for women. And then if I never smoked, it's 78 for men and 81 for women. So I'm adding... Um, a, a significant number of years of life to my life if, I haven't, if I'm not a smoker. Um, and you, there's an argument to be made that those are better quality of life years. So again, back to the slide at the very beginning, one in five people who um, die in the United States, their death can be attributable to, to tobacco. But for every one of those people, there are 30 people who have some kind of um, serious illness as a result of their tobacco use. So not only am I living longer, but my quality of life is better because I'm uh, less likely to be experiencing those illnesses. But even if I quit smoking at age 65, I'm still adding a year and a half or up, up to 2.7 years of extra life onto my life. So, it's not, so I like this slide because it doesn't matter when you, quit, when you stop um, using, you're more likely uh, to live longer at any age. More benefits of quitting, so culture of recovery, using those, healthy, whoa, using those healthy coping skills, identifying as a healthy person, tobacco-free, so that sense of identity can be really powerful. A lot of times people, when they come into recovery, like being a healthy person, eating healthy, exercise, that kind of stuff is really important to them and part of their identity as a person in recovery. Accomplishing something difficult, and a lot of people are motivated just by the financial of it. So, Let's say you smoke one pack a day, it's $7 a day, it's $210 in one month, $2,500 in a year, $12,000 after five years. Like what else could you use with that money? And sometimes people will say, well, I wouldn't save it, I would just like waste it on fancy lattes. But that's a fancy latte you get that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise, right? So for whatever it is, it's like a, I mean, you, you get something instead of this. Okay, so are you ready? So some steps for quitting. This come from smokefree.gov, so you can get more information about these. Step one, thinking about quitting. So this is like, okay, just get it on your radar. You're not making a commitment to quit or not to quit, but you're just making a commitment to be thinking about it. 
So learn about tobacco use and recovery. Start to understand how your own tobacco use has played into your own recovery or your own uh, active addiction. Ask people who've stopped quitting about their experience with, with using tobacco. Think about your own nicotine addiction and weigh the pros and cons. So the pros and cons both of changing and the pros and cons both of, of staying the same. So what's good about continuing to smoke? What's bad about continuing to smoke? What would be good about being a non-smoker? What would be hard about being a non-smoker? Think about all this stuff. Uh, I'm gonna make a plan for what it's gonna look like when I'm a non-smoker. So sometimes um, there's things that I might wanna do in advance. So I might wanna get my car cleaned if I smoke in my car so it doesn't smell like cigarettes, clean out my ashtrays, get rid of paraphernalia, wash my clothes, get my teeth cleaned, whatever um, I might wanna do in order to be ready, right? Because those triggers that seem, take a different route to work, whatever are, whatever are the situations where I'm more likely to be triggered to smoke, how am I gonna cope with those? Ask for support, so let my sponsor know, let my therapist know, let my counselor know, let my family know, let my supports know, let my, let my kids know, whoever is in my life who helps and supports me through challenging things, let these people know what's going on with me and that this is something I'm working on. It doesn't matter if they're working on it too, necessarily. Hi, sorry I broke it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter if it's something that they're working on too, people can support us even if they're still smokers. So uh, talk to people about it so that you can get that social support. Sometimes you might be using nicotine replacement, so that might be um, gum, lozenges, or the patch, which are available over the counter, or a nicotine inhaler or spray, which requires prescriptions. I wanna follow the instructions for this, though, and keep in mind that usually there's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I smoke one cigarette, I usually get one milligram of nicotine, and so I don't, if I'm using nicotine replacement to try to wean off of cigarettes, I don't want to get more nicotine from the NRT than I was getting from smoking. And this is super common that people start using nicotine replacement and end up actually increasing their physical dependence on nicotine. So if I smoke a pack a day, it's about 20 cigarettes, I would, would want, and I'm going to use the patch, I'd want to use like a, a 21 milligram patch to start with and then wean down from there. So I just want to make sure that I'm not getting too much nicotine. Sometimes people are like, I feel so lightheaded and dizzy all the time. And I'm like, girl, you're, drink you're, you're getting a lot of nicotine in your body. Thank you. I'll switch again. Just to save the day as usual. Okay. Um, E-cigarettes we talked about a little bit earlier. So they were unregulated until 2016. They're regulated now. There's more regulations coming down the pike. Um, they're a little tricky, so the people, so part of the regulation is that whoever is manufacturing the juice that goes in the e-cigarette or the nicotine, what are they calling it, ENDS, electronic nicotine delivery system, uh, whatever, whoever is manufacturing that needs to follow certain guidelines and whether that's being done very consistently or not, it's tricky. So suffice it to say, e-cigarettes at the moment are not one of the FDA approved mechanisms for, um, for tobacco recovery, basically. Um, although I know that they're pushing towards trying to have something that's more regulated that people could use more readily. Since people seem to have a preference to use e-cigarettes instead of regular cigarettes in some situations. Um, medications can also help. So Welbutrin and Chantex are, are the two that are FDA approved to help with tobacco recovery. And uh, they, have, uh, they have side effects. That you, they need, you need a prescription in order to get them, so you just want to consult with a doctor and you wouldn't want to be taking these things unless you and your doctor had decided that they will be helpful for you. Um, it's, it's been relatively unregulated, and so there isn't, uh, so it's not, uh, well the best I can say is that it's not FDA recommended right now as a, as a tobacco cessation tool. Although, again, I, the FDA is requesting uh, proposals for um, new um, uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems that uh, I think they want to try to have approved as like to, as smoking cessation tools, but they're not there yet. But I would imagine that in the next, what year is it, 2017? I would imagine that within the next five years there will be some that are like actually on market for that purpose. But I'm, I don't know for sure. Right, so part of the argument is that a lot of what is bad, there's a lot of, th there's stuff that is hard about nicotine itself, but a lot of what is bad about tobacco is like the other additives and things that, that occur from the actual process of smoking it. And so if there's a reduction in that, then that could be helpful. <coughs> um, but it's complicated and I don't think they're quite there yet with where they want to be with, in terms of monitoring.
Yeah, for the first several years that those were popular, there was all kinds of chemicals, all kinds of stuff was, was in there. Um, and so they're trying to, I really think they're, they're trying to like get their arms around exactly what's in them, how do, we, how do we manage this, like the popularity has really exploded, how do we, how do we just get this to be something that is um, more safely used for people. It, it's arguably better because of the lack of smoked tobacco, but it is also arguably worse because you don't necessarily know what is in the juice that's in the vape. And you're still, it doesn't do anything to address the nicotine issue. Yeah. Okay, so as of January of 2016, um, Medicaid and Healthy Michigan plans all seven, uh, approve and cover all seven of, I'm sorry, cover all seven of these FDA approved medications. So the five different types of nicotine replacement and then Wellbutrin and Chantix. So these are able to be paid for if you have, Mich if you have Healthy Michigan or Medicaid, which has been awesome because before it was hard for people to have access to these if this was part of their tobacco recovery plan. Um, nicotine inhaler you have to get a prescription for. So you'd get a prescription from your doctor and take it to the pharmacy. It's, a, it's literally an inhaler that administers nicotine. Yeah, it's different than an e-cigarette in that it's regulated and we know exactly how much nicotine is in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can also use the strategy of 12-step recovery, which a lot of us are familiar with. So steps one through three, admitting we're powerless over our tobacco use, believing that a higher power could help us, deciding to ask for help from that higher power, and using the element of social support. So talking with tobacco-free members of the recovering community about what worked for them, building a tobacco-free support network, and helping others who are trying to be tobacco-free. As with any 12-step groups, it's just, it's up to people to start the group. And so it just hasn't been something that's really been initiated in, in our tighter community. Um, step three is quitting. So following through on your plans, staying busy, drinking a lot of water, avoiding smoky places and smoky people, uh, socializing with people who are tobacco free, taking it one day at a time. And again, more quit attempts increase your likelihood of success. So the, don't quit quitting. The more that I keep quitting, the better. Some tips for managing cravings. So you could brush your teeth, count backwards. What's important to recognize here is that the craving is going to pass whether you smoke or not. So if I can distract myself with something else for a few minutes, about the same amount of time that it would take to smoke the cigarette, the craving can pass. And then step four, staying quit. So celebrating tobacco-free anniversaries, making a big deal about it, recognizing the ways that my body is recovering from tobacco use. So again, when I worked at the farm, people would, like there's this big staircase that goes from the basement to, to the first floor. And people would be like, I ran up the stairs and I like could breathe when I got to the top. And that was like, that would be a big deal because it was different. And it was something like relatively small but measurable. And that happened relatively quickly when people stopped smoking. Um, okay. So there's a few slides uh, in your packet about things that addiction professionals can do or treatment programs can do to help support people who are trying to quit. Um, so these steps come from uh, a, a addiction treatment campus <coughs> that went smoke free. So obtain buy-in from existing staff, establish willingness from leadership, create a task force and establish policies and procedures. Um, staff roles are to support tobacco recovery, care about the client's health and wellness, believe that tobacco cessation impacts recovery, and avoid ambivalence about it. So ambivalence is like, I'm either way about it. I'm not either way about it. I know that this is helpful to you and I want to support you in making this change. Staff, import, staff attitude is super important. Uh, interventions that have been shown to help with this are phys a physician advising you to quit an intervention that takes longer than 10 minutes. So if I just mention this for two seconds to you, it doesn't have much of an impact. But if I talk about it for more than 10 minutes, it has more of an impact. If I talk to you about it multiple times, that has more of an impact. Um, Self-help is only slightly higher than no intervention at all. So if I just hand you a pamphlet and say work on this and think about it, that's basically it's not much better than just doing nothing. Individual counseling about it helps. And the best outcome comes from multiple of these interventions at one time. So if I talk to you about it for more than 10 minutes, I check in with you about it every time we do treatment planning, our doctor advises you to quit, and I give you some pamphlets and information, all of that together can create a more robust um, support that can be more helpful. In a counseling session, I wanna provide basic information, help recognize trigger situations, and develop coping skills for those. That's the most important stuff that we can do because the coping skills and the habit of it are the two things that are hardest to overcome. 
for helping professionals, we can always do the five A's, ask, advise, so advise people to quit, again, not ambivalent, um, assess, willingness to quit, quit, assist in the quit effort, and arrange follow-up. So if these are the, if you take away anything, if you're helping professional today, take away the, the five A's, ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. And then there's loads of resources. So the Michigan Smokers Quit Kit that has three steps, are you ready, planning, and after you've quit. The Tobacco Resource Exchange is my favorite thing because they have um, many examples of policies and procedures on that like administrative level. They also have for clinicians sample, um, sample groups that you can do that just that literally say talk about this first and then do these activities and then talk about this and then do this activity and then talk about this right so super um, straightforward clear and easy to follow and easy also to sort of customize and use pieces of if that's what your preference is uh, the you know, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has um, clinical practice guidelines which are helpful. Smokefree.gov is helpful. There's a tobacco treatment for persons with substance use disorders toolkit. And then the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line. So the other thing other than the five A's, if you take one resource away with you tonight, take this one. It's just 1-800-QUIT-NOW, which is the same number for anywhere in the United States. It'll filter you to um, the Michigan hotline and the Michigan resources. They do initial screenings, phone counseling, you can get up to four sessions of phone counseling, plus there's 24-7 20, phone availability, there's online resources, and you can get linked into text messages. There's special support for pregnant women and new moms, so pregnant women and new moms can get up to nine sessions of phone counseling. You can get free NRT, they can mail it to you where you live. And they can also do referrals to other tobacco resource services or tobacco recovery services. So if you have private insurance or you're able to get resources in a different way, they can help sort that out during that initial screening. So 1-800-QUIT-NOW. They're available 24-7. You can just call them and try to get some of the first steps in what you would need to do. Even if you're not committed to quitting, this can help move in the direction of resolving some of that ambivalence and making a decision one way or the other. Okay, we're ready for our panel. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Uh, my name is Ted, and um, so I, um, I'll just dive right into it. I started smoking, I think I was probably like 11 or 12 years old. Like, I would smoke every now and then, and then, um, unfortunately, I, I think I started smoking full time at the age of like 15 when I started to go to like recovery meetings. Um, that was where I started smoking, um, and uh, I started doing like <clears throat> recovery when I was 15 or 16 years old. So I smoked the whole time. I'm 42 now, and I quit last December. Um, I think I probably tried to quit smoking. I don't know, probably 20 times, um, at least over the past five years. And um, so the last time I I, mean, I tried everything. I tried uh, lozenges. I tried gum. I tried just quitting. I tried like the whole. I'm gonna exercise a whole bunch, and then I won't want to smoke anymore. Um, I tried um, Wellbutrin, and then um, I tried Chantix once, and, it, and I still. I mean, I wasn't able to quit for more than like three days with anything. And then the last time I quit smoking, I was. Um, I went to see my doctor and he was like, well, let's just try the Chantix again. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll try that. And then I, you know, you take it for a few days and then you quit smoking. And then during that whole time, I was building up like a support program. I told my friends I was quitting. Um, I told my son I was quitting, who's like nine years old. And um, he'd been asking me to quit for a long time. <clears throat> I think that's something they do in school. Is you tell the kids about, you know, the parents are killing themselves. And then, um, so, you know, I mean, I, I talk to different people who support me in other ways, and uh, my family, uh, my mom had smoked for like 30, 40 years or something, so she was really, she's quit, and she was really helpful. Um, so, I, I mean, I just started taking the Chantix, and then, you know, for some reason I was lucky enough to get pneumonia about three days into taking that, which made it real easy to quit smoking because I couldn't breathe. Right. You know, the, um, and that lasted for like three weeks. I mean, I couldn't even walk up and down stairs. I just laid like on the couch for weeks. And um, 
But you know, like the smoking was a big part of my life. So I mean, I'd smoke a couple packs a day at least. Um, I would sit out on my front porch and just smoke cigarettes. And like I knew everyone who lived in my area that smoked because they would just sit out there and smoke with me. I knew their life stories because I spent all day out there smoking. I had, you know, I mean, the, my, that was the thing. My whole life revolved around smoking. You know, I bought certain, you know, I would buy a leather interior car because I wouldn't burn it as easily. Um, you know, I would buy certain coats because the back rip wouldn't burn as easily. Um, I'd wear certain pants because I wouldn't burn them. You know, I'd go to certain places um, because I knew I could smoke. And, you know, so af after I quit that, I, I just noticed after time, like, everything changed. Like, and people told me everything was going to change in my car, right? Whatever, I'm just quitting smoking. But it did. It's liberating. Like, you know, and, and I'm, I'm in recovery. You know, being in recovery is liberating, but having this one final thing off my back makes me feel like I'm actually in recovery for the first time. Um, because I don't have anything else that's running my life. Um, you know, it. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's just made everything made everything change. And then you know the big thing is, is I'm not a bad example for my son anymore. You know, um, and it's been a year and he doesn't even really remember that I did smoke. So he remembers that he'd seen me do it, but not that I smoked all the time. So that's pretty much my story. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Izzy. Um, I started smoking in my 20s and I smoked from the time I was like 22 until I got pregnant at 25. And then I quit smoking because I was pregnant and I stayed quit until um, I got into my alcohol and drug addiction. And I periodically <coughs> smoked an active addiction, but I wasn't a regular smoker. Um, I really picked up cigarettes regularly when I got sober. Um, I got sober in 2007 and I quit smoking December 2nd, 2013. Um, and what happened with me was I had uh, one other attempt um, be in, in recovery to quit smoking in 2012. And I was going to Italy, and it was a really good motivation to like know I was going to be on a plane for a long time and not able to smoke. So I really wanted to quit so I wasn't having cravings on the plane. And then I didn't really want to smoke in Italy. Plus, I didn't know what their cigarettes would be like over there. So, <laughs> so um, I went on this trip, and I, I stayed quit. Um, I came back from the trip, and a few weeks. Later, I had a uh, relapse on opiates, um, and I started smoking again. Um, so I smoked until the following year, December, and then I was going in for a major surgery, and my doctor told me that he would not even schedule the surgery until I quit smoking, and I quit that day. I just put him down. I wanted the surgery done really bad. I'd been waiting to have it for a long time, and I haven't yet picked up a cigarette since then. Um, I didn't use any nicotine replacement therapy. I just quit and I replaced um, the action of smoking with drinking water. And so I used to carry water bottles around with me. Every time I would have a craving, I'd drink water. And every time the cravings got really bad, I would go for a run. And I hate running. So, so the cravings went away pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's um, the struggle for me afterwards has been my weight. Um, I still use a little bit of sugar and I still drink coffee. And um, when I first quit smoking, the sugar addiction got quite. Um, out of hand for a while and um, for me I just I feel better my um, cravings for other things are better when I just don't drink coffee if I don't use sugar if I don't smoke like I don't do anything then I'm much more 
emotionally well and I'm not thinking about those substances all the time. So, um, my grandson is going to be three and he has never seen me smoke, which makes me very happy. And, uh, and my kids um, are very happy that I quit. So, that's my story. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ted, and uh, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, drug addict, and a former smoker. My sobriety date is August 18th, 2008, and my uh, quit date for tobacco was June 1st of this year. So I started smoking when I was four. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I, I was just thinking about that, like that would be, that, to me that's kind of funny to see a four-year-old smoke. But um, it's not, is it? Um, but I probably had my first cigarette when I was like five or six years old, you know. My mom was a smoker. I have a twin brother and, and one brother who's younger, one year younger. There's seven kids in my family. And we would steal my mom's cigarettes, you know. And I grew up in Ann Arbor. Um, I started smoking, um, and I can remember those uh, those smoking, you know, those days smoking, and what it was like, and how much I liked it. Even today, um, I have to say that I've sm I've quit a number of times. When I quit, and, and I'm going to tell you some things that um, you know I think are like glamorous and, and great about smoking because that's what unfortunately has kept bringing me back to tobacco. Um, when I quit smoking and I'll quit for a week or so and then I'll have that first cigarette, the taste is amazing. Like, oh, it's just like like no other. And I remember, it's like, that's what it tasted when I was, I can remember the taste when I was a kid. And that's what it, re it reminded me of, is when I smoked when I was little. Um, but I, I did smoke for, you know, I started smoking regularly, steady, a pack a day, at probably age 15 or so, uh, maybe 12 or 13 actually. And unfortunately, my parents let me smoke, you know. It became okay for me to smoke. I can remember as a minor just like smoking in the car, um, it, which is just a trip. My mom smoking in the front and, and me smoking in the back. Um, <coughs> So that didn't help. Um, I was able to smoke in the house, um, which I find, you know, even recently being a smoker, we would never smoke in the house. We would always go outside, you know. And um, so um, I smoked for, I, I know I don't look it, but I'm 53. So I smoked for about 40 years. Um, and uh, I, you know, I've quit on, on many times. Um, unfortunately, I've really only quit for more than a state quit for more than a year once. Um, I work for Dawn Farm. Dawn Farm has a program um, where they'll pay you two hundred dollars to quit if you've quit for for a year. You have to pay back that two hundred dollars um, when you start smoking, which I had to pay back um, a couple of years ago. Um, so I, oh, I think this is, oh no, there it is, oh. uh, I, I mean, like Anna was sharing some of those facts, like most people who smoke would like to quit. I mean, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, we know how bad it is for us. Um, I mean, I know myself, you know, uh, there were things that I liked about smoking, and certainly I knew that it would, I'd be better off without it. I mean, the cost is, is um, you know, out of control. Um, obviously, I don't feel good doing it. It's, it's unhealthy. Um, that's one thing that's unfortunate about, that I find unfortunate about smoking and, and quitting, is when I, I've smoked for a long time, so I quit, and I feel like immediately within a day, I mean, I'm taking deep breaths and I'm like, I feel like I can breathe. Now normally, when I'm a regular smoker and I take a deep breath like that, I will literally cough. 
Um, other parts of me are, you know, somewhat healthy, but the, the lungs are not. So I'll, I'll cough. And right away, within the first day, I notice a difference. You know, I'm breathing easier. I'm, I mean, I'm noticing these improvements. When I start smoking, when I go back to smoking, it's not like all of a sudden I can't breathe. You know, I don't notice a decrease in my health uh, when I begin smoking again, which is unfortunate. Um, I like the thing about um, using the 12 steps um, <clears throat> because I, I know that that's, uh, I think the 12 steps can work for any anything that you want to do. Um, certainly, I'm powerless over tobacco. <clears throat> the one mistake I know, or I, I know one mistake I can make is to say I'm going to have one cigarette. I've done that so many times, like I'll be at, like with friends, um, and I'm like, oh, it's such a nice day, let me have a cigarette. And I'll just have one. And then the next day, and I repeat this because this is true for me, I've experienced it so many times. The next day I'll have one, the next day I'll have one, the next day two, the next day I bought a pack. And I'm a smoker again, before I know it. And it's so hard to quit. And we say in recovery, it's easier to stay quit than get, it's easier to stay sober than to get sober. It's definitely easier to stay quit from tobacco than it is to get quit. So um, I learned that lesson, you know, I've told myself that lesson repeatedly, but I'll make that same stupid mistake. I hope that this time, um, I, you know, I'm gonna remind myself of that. One good thing that's happened to me recently in this quit experience is, is I quit. Um, I work another, for another employer part-time, and that employer offered to pay all the employees a lot of money to quit, um, thousands of dollars to quit. And I was like, sign me up. I was um, taking Chantex um, and uh, I, planning on quitting, um, but I was cheating. Um, I was cheating and I was, I was heading right back to being a regular smoker and then this offer came up from this employer where they were gonna pay us $2,000 to quit for three months. And I was immediately like, signed me up, you know, which I did. I mean, it was, it was a, definitely a big um, motivator for me. Um, but while I was in that three month uh, period, um, like one of my best friends quit, um, who was a terribly heavy smoker. You know, he couldn't, I couldn't stand even watch him. Even if I was smoking, God, you're such a terrible smoker. Like, you can't, like, you chain smoke those cigarettes down. His dad had just died last, um, a year ago. Um, and he continued to smoke, which I found, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's that's just an indication of how bad uh, an, uh, an addiction it is. And then another really close, close friend, he saw me quit, he saw my friend Michael quit, and he quit. And now, um, you know, like we're in it together. It's so motivating. We play poker, a bunch of people in recovery play poker at some friends every Friday night. And now that whole household, everybody that comes, is, there's no smokers anymore. This is just amazing. Um, so, I'm feeling better every day, um, I can do this, I can stay quit. It's just like drugs and alcohol, I say to people at treatment, um, in treatment, you know, when I talk about quitting smoking, it's like people in recovery know, um, we would be fools to say, I'm going to just have one drink, you know, we know, we're told over and over, we can't have one drink, we, we wouldn't say I'm going to have one drug. Um, we can't have one cigarette if we don't want to, if we want to stay quit, so. Um, and, and one thing I'll, the last thing I'll say is, it is a son of a bitch to um, quit smoking in recovery because everybody, it seems like everybody smokes. Um, the statistics were like 80, 75, 80%, I absolutely believe that. I mean, if you go to AA meetings here in town, you'll see a ton of young people in recovery I mean, I always say when people show up at treatment and they're in their 20s, I said, don't worry, once you, you'll see in Ann Arbor, there are tons of young people. You're gonna go to meetings with 100 people your age. And after those meetings and before those meetings, there is a crowd of people and they are smoking. Um, 
So it's tough. You've got to kind of move through that crowd and get inside. I mean, I'll, I'll like not go to meetings early because of all the smoking that occurs. I mean, I'm, I'm in a safe place now. I mean, I feel really strong about it, but man, when I first quit, it would be like, I got to get there right before I go right inside because uh, it's tough. But I can see how, you know, um, there's strength in numbers and uh, it's possible for friends and it, and it could be something that can catch on, you know, because um, I think deep down people, you know, they want to quit. So thanks. Hey, I'm Steve. Um, ironically, I uh, think I was be five or six, and I nagged the hell out of my dad to quit smoking. And then he did quit. And then I proceeded to start smoking for 20 years. Um, but I, I see a lot of parallels between uh, tobacco and nicotine recovery and, and alcohol recovery. Um, I didn't start at the same time. A lot of, like, what, what a lot of the slides said, like, it was just no way. This is way too difficult. It's way too big. Um, and then as soon as I got into treatment and into, you know, living a lifestyle of recovery, yeah, smoking is everywhere. And the culture, um, the culture of addiction is very much there. I very much stayed in it. And, um, I kind of made smoking out in my head to be this, like, like impossible thing. Like I really did identify myself as a smoker and I was convinced I would always smoke and that quitting smoking was somehow impossible. Um, and, and I stuck with that for, for a really long time and, and then even um, after so many other aspects of my life had changed, I started living, you know, I didn't want to live uh, the lifestyle of, of an alcoholic anymore. And in many respects I stopped, but I still noticed that there's this dissonance between like the person I wanted to be and the actual lifestyle I was living. And smoking and, and health was, was a huge part of that, but I still just couldn't imagine uh, trying to quit smoking. So I was probably two years into, into recovery from alcohol um, before I, I made a serious attempt to, to stop smoking. And, and I was motivated uh, by a job. I was actually in school and I had an internship and I was working with, with little kids and I didn't think it really made a lot of sense to read like tobacco while like hanging out with little kids and telling them they should like listen to their parents and stuff. Um, so I just didn't really think that was gonna work. Um, so I did quit and, and um, I never had any success with like the nicotine replacement stuff, but I did have uh, a vaporizer for a little while and, and I was very aware of like the sort of arms race which has continued since I put smoking with these things. Like, they're gonna get banned on planes or something. Like, they're just, they're crazy. They're scary huge. Um, but they did, and, and I've, I've seen that most people who, <coughs> that I know who, who kind of sweat from smoking to using like a vaporizer eventually like ramp the nicotine <coughs> way up and end up smoking. Um, again, I don't have statistics on it, but that's just been what like, my learned experience has been. So I used it for, I was using a vaporizer for a couple of weeks. I almost immediately went down to like zero nicotine because like Anna was saying in the, in, the, uh, in the slides, like it was more the lifestyle and the habit and, and like the physical process for me that I was addicted to more than the nicotine itself. But then I remember I was like in my office one day at my little, my little internship and I was like hitting the vaporizer and like blowing it out the window. And I was like, this is the stuff I used to do with drugs. This is, like, this is how I used to use drugs. It's like trying to like not get caught doing it. And I was like, what the hell has happened? I've gone around the bed on this thing. Um, so I had to, I, I, I still actually own the vaporizer, but I, I kind of stopped using it after that. And, and um, you know, this is the part where it really, was very different from my alcohol recovery. It's like with alcohol recovery, I was just very dug in. Like I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to relapse, and it was a life or death thing because it, because it really was. And when I tried to think about smoking that way, like it really stressed me out. Um, and I would have these episodes where it's like, you know, it started, you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Like I quit smoking, and then I go a couple of months, and I get super stressed out, and I'm like, I have to smoke, I have to smoke, and I would make myself crazy until I smoked. And I'd have a couple of cigarettes, and, and it wouldn't make me any less stressed out. But since I hadn't smoked for a while, I had like no tolerance to nicotine, so it would make me nauseous. So not only am I stressed out, like now I kind of want to puke. Yeah. And it's up. 
but I still kept doing that. And, and I, I, after a while, I started to sort of loosen up and say, like, you know what, if it takes seven, ten times, I'm just going to keep quitting. And, and I just kept doing it. And I remember, like, I'm a person who's really, like, a big fan of, like, meditation and mindfulness and stuff like that. And I remember one time that, that, that one of these really intense nicotine craving came up. Like, not just a passing thing, but, like, I'm going to smoke, or my head's going to explode, or the whole world's going to end, and I'm going to burst in flames. Like, nicotine fit. Like, and it wasn't even nicotine. It was just all in my head. But I was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm just not going to smoke. I'm not going to smoke. I'm just going to sit here. And I'm going to think about how badly I want to smoke until it's over. I'm going to wait until, because the craving is going to go away whether I smoke or not. And I actually just watched it pass. And then I didn't smoke. And I was convinced I was a superhero. It was amazing. I, was, I couldn't believe that I did. And, and I, was, I was so empowered by that. And it's really pushed me to, 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 to keep going. And I don't know that that was necessarily the last time that I smoked, but um, you know, the benefits on the side have been so much better. And since I've really become quit, uh, committed to, to quitting and really thinking of myself as a non-smoker, which uh, I was encouraged by other people in recovery, like, why don't you, instead of just quitting smoking, like, think of yourself as a person who's a non-smoker, and that really did make a difference. And I, and I changed my identity around it, and, um, you know, it, it's it's just shown so much benefit, so, so many benefits in terms of, like, all the other changes that I thought were hard, like, changing exercise habits, changing diet habits, changing cleaning around the house, I was like, all these things, like, I've quit alcohol and that was hard, but I was convinced smoking was impossible. And I quit smoking and now it's kind of like, well, then I can try to do any. Um, so that, that's really, it's been just tremendously empowering for me to, to do that, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I will say that uh, I, I started dating someone who was a smoker once I was a non-smoker, and there was probably a couple of reasons that one wasn't gonna pan out, but like, smoking <laughs> is definitely a deal breaker for me now. And I'm thinking that, like, as far as people that I want to be in a relationship with, like, I don't want that to be a deal breaker. But for me, like, it is. Like, I'm not, I couldn't date a smoker and not end up smoking again. And I got to figure that a lot of non-smokers probably feel that way about me. And I think that that's, that's another thing I think I was being like, a really strong incentive to, to stay quit. And, um, you know, it, it, it's definitely taken some time, but it's, uh, it, it feels like normal to me now, which I never thought it would. So it's been pretty cool. Thanks for the job.